kind of experience and local strategies of propelling this, especially in the new normal uh, perspectives. So, Mayor, you, you are given uh, time, so the floor is yours. Good day. I am your spokesperson, Mayor Hamamatsu. I would like to express my gratitude to our hosts, Zenjo City and the UCLZ ASPAC Secretari Secretariat for this opportunity to share Hamamatsu experience and introduce our work before and during the pandemic. Uh, today, I will talk about the following points. The characteristics of Hamamatsu, our coronavirus response, creating a dual mode society and digital smart city Hamamatsu. First, the, the characteristics interpreter from Jinjo cannot hear the speaker. Hamamatsu has the Secretary second General, biggest the city interpreter cannot hear the speaker. in Japan and is blessed with a side cannot diverse speak, cannot natural hear. and social environment. As a result of this, our city is also called a microcosm of Japan. Sorry, I would like to remind you have the Secretary longest General, healthy life Jinjo expectancy side hear. in the country and are known as the best place of world, famous businesses including Suzuki, Yamaha, and Honda. Hamamatsu coronavirus response has four key areas. The first is safety and security. We have two measures so in Mr. Speaker, place please turn for on your infection mic. prevention that were unique Mr. Speaker, to can Hamamatsu. You hear? Please turn on the mic. And the the Hamamatsu side cannot safe hear. and secure restaurant certification system and aid for the implementation of three C's prevention measures, crowds, closed spaces, and close contact in businesses. A system for businesses that implemented the three C's preventive measures in their shops so that customers can feel safe Secretary and General and Mr. Be and buzz. Certified, certified restaurants uh, issued stickers that show that they have met conditions to provide a safe and secure space to dine and the name of the shop is listed on the city website. Aid is available for businesses to help purchase equipment for preventive measures. For example, partitions and face shields, etc. This is a line COVID-19 monitoring system. The users scan the QR code displayed outside the shop using the line application on their smartphone, which then registers them. If someone that was using the shop at the same time and date as the user has tested positive for coronavirus, the system will inform them by sending a message. The crowd congestion level lamp. It displays crowd levels in various facilities across the city. The date is provided as open date and displayed on IT communication sites and the websites of the shops or facilities. This is to help the residents avoid the three C's. The second area in our response to COVID-19 is economic measures. The first measure is our cashback campaign for people who ate uh, at certificated restaurants. We estimate that there was an economic impact of over 1.5 billion yen over the two campaigns that was implemented between March 2021 and May 2021. The second major is a large scale reward point campaign in cooperation with biggest cashless service in Japan, PayPay. Last July, we implemented a 
a campaign where 30 percent of uh, patches is returned back in reward points when the customer pays using PayPay at participating restaurants and, and estimated econom economic impact of 2 billion yen through consumption at participating shops inside Hamamat City. There is also the opening of the Lakuten Online Food Fair. We held the fair four times last year with sales of over 400 million yen. Similar to how PayPay reward points were an incentive to go to restaurants and shops, this campaign was an incentive for online shopping. Both of these initiatives were to support local businesses. This year, we plan on opening an official Hamamatsu local specialty web page on Lakuten as the next step in improving the support for local businesses. This is our delivery platform, Foodrix. As part of our support for food businesses, we created a site that listed all shops the shops that voice. provided takeaway take services. However, the lack of delivery services the, uh, available became a problem. What this video that is why the original we created a delivery platform that connects all delivery services in the local medium as well as allowed the customer to order, pay and request delivery in one place. Uderix aims to create a new business model that effectively uses delivery resources, lowers handling fees, and widens the available areas for deliveries. This platform does not only support businesses, but is also a that puts those who are unable to leave their homes. Next is the third area, remote work and services. We have been working remotely due to limited face-to-face -face communication during the pandemic and equipped all government offices with video conference equipment. Now, remote work has not only helped continue our work, but has also contributed in re reducing our commute time and revitalized communication. Also, we have used it to provide administrative services such as health consultations remotely so that the residents do not have to come into the city office directly. Last but not least is promotion of movement. The pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities of big cities such as Tokyo. There is an increasing amount of young people in their 20s living in the Tokyo region, moving into regional areas. Hamamatsu wants to seize uh, this opportunity and is putting effort into attracting satellite offices and startup ventures to our city. Following our coronavirus response is the creation of a dual mode society. From now on, despite risk in the future, not just limited to the coronavirus, we have to create a sustainable society that can balance infection control and economic activities using digital technologies. Technology. Hamamatsu is focusing its efforts on creating such a society. In the future, everything will have a dual mode. For example, eating in or ordering a delivery, seeing a doctor or seeing a doctor virtually. 
a dual mode society will not only allow cities to be sustainable, but can also create opportunities through the development of different services. The key to everything is the Digital Smart City Hamamatsu Initiative. Hamamatsu signed the Digital Pass Declaration on October 2019 to promote sustainable urban development using digital technology. As the birth rate continued to decrease as and population ages, it is becoming increasingly important to support our current and future workforce. Digital technology and advancement will be essential. In April 2020, the Digital Smart Cities Promotion Headquarters was established as part of the government office. We also established the public and private sector partnership platform to promote cooperation between the public and, uh, and private sectors. It's because of these organizational structures that we were able to swiftly respond using digital technologies during the COVID pandemic. Last year, we formulated the concept of digital smart cities with the aim to improve of the quality of life of residents, optimize urban development, and create a connected future through digital technology. Hamamats has joined the G20 Smart Cities Alliance and uh, cooperating with cities in Japan and internationally. Hamamats Digital Smart Cities Initiative and concept plan was highly evaluated and we are selected as a pilot city last October by the Alliance. Hamamatsu City has the highest healthy life expectancy in Japan. The Hamamatsu Wellness Project is to further improve on, upon our strengths to build a city where its residents can live healthier and happier lives. Hamamatsu Wellness Lab, a famous and large company, has taken part in the planning. Together with the company, we have implemented the trial runs to gather data and evidence for the use of digital technologies contributing to disease prevention and improve the health of the residents. The data that is gathered will be stored on the platform created by Wellness Lab to be used by Hamamatsu City in its health and disease prevention policies and for the development of various businesses. Hamamatsu also has the highest number of renewable energy installations in Japan. Hamamatsu aims for zero carbon dioxide emission by 2050 and last March made a declaration for RE100. RE100 means uh, 100% renewable energy in the Hamamatsu area. Through cooperation between public and private sectors, we strive to create an energy smart city, a resilient and low carbon society that has no worries about energy. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Suzuki, for a very, very interesting presentation. Also sharing with us uh, your actions, your initiatives uh, during this uh, COVID-19 and your also recovery plan. And it's good to uh, see here how you have been engaging uh, business sectors as well as also uh, young people, uh, young uh, generation in, in your uh, actions. Thank you very much. We will uh, uh, come back to you later for uh, discussions. But please uh, uh, let me invite now uh, the second speaker, the Vice Governor of East Java Province, Dr. Emil Dadak. Time is yours. 
Thank you, Secretary General, uh, Dr. Bernadia. So I've been asked to speak about propelling new normal from steady recovery to sustainable welfare Asia Pacific post COVID condition. Allow me to uh, show my slides uh, in this forum. Okay. All right, uh, uh, a very good morning to all participants, uh, or good afternoon. Uh, distinguished uh, mayors and leaders of regional governments in Asia Pacific, and uh, panel uh, presidents and co-presidents of UCLG ASPEC, uh, and the host mayor, Jingzhou. Uh, allow me to present the situation in East Java. As you all know, East Java is one of the province in Indonesia. We have 38 municipalities in East Java. So that's the largest number of municipalities among all the provinces in Indonesia. And we have had uh, serious episodes of COVID-19 that uh, gave us a big challenge uh, in the management of this province. And I'd like to share the story with you. Next. So uh, if we look at the case in Indonesia and the case in East Java, we can see that uh, we had a, a significant increase in the beginning of 2021. Uh, that became the first peak, uh, 14,000 for the whole country combined, and uh, 1644, 1644 for East Java alone. But then uh, that, uh, that number uh, jumped uh, in July uh, because of uh, a lot of people say one of it is because of the Delta variant. So the cases then jumped up to 56,000 nationwide, and in East Java it became 8,227. But a lot of hard work has been put in from the mid of July uh, until uh, the uh, until today. We've managed to reduce it from 8,227 cases into only 361 cases uh, as of uh, yesterday, uh, as of 6th of September. So this is a, a lot of uh, uh, hard work uh, from all walks of the society. And uh, nationally, also from 56,000 become 4,400 cases. Uh, next. Now, in terms of vaccination, uh, 7.6 million population in our province has been vaccinated. Uh, and this is only between the 3rd of July until the 5th of September. So during the course of nearly two months, we vaccinated 7.6 million in our province alone. So this, uh, in a day, we managed to vaccinate 255,000 uh, people. Uh, that's the uh, uh, the number. Of course, this number varies from day to day, but um, uh, that's what we have done uh, for uh, uh, for the total vaccination. Next, next slide, please. Okay. So what happened? Uh, uh, COVID nineteen first entered our country in the twentieth of March, and then we took the policy of really closing down activities, offices, schools. Even religious uh, mass prayers have been restricted. Transportation has been restricted. And then we implemented what we call as a large scale social activity limitations that took place uh, in nearly two, uh, one, one month uh, to two months. And then we experienced an improvement uh, in May until June, cases actually declined uh, or at flattened, the curve flattened. We don't see an increase, but we don't see as much a decrease as well. But what happened is then we managed to be able to equip our hospitals, make sure that we can get secure, we can secure supply of a mask and also of hazardous uh, uh, suit for the medical personnel. And we started to begin to transition. People begin to take play, uh, resume activities with uh, caution using, of course, mask and physical distancing. And this took place uh, uh, until July and August, and we enacted a regional decree that we issued together with the local legislation, local legislative, and then uh, that regulation allows us to provide even fines and sanctions to those who actually violate the health protocol regulations. But schools remain closed. Yeah, and then uh, uh, in September and October, what happened, uh, we managed to flatten the curve again, but in November, we saw an increase in the case until December, so that we had to really restrict the end of year seasonal movements. Uh, we, uh, the long weekends were curbed and uh, a lot of uh, uh, recreational facilities were required to not operate because of the likelihood that cases will rise in towards the end of the year. And in the beginning of uh, 2021, 
we implemented what we call as the uh, people activity limitation. It's not a large scale social activity limitation. So for example, uh, uh, restaurants were asked to operate at 25% capacity, uh, shopping centers were asked to close at 7 p.m. Uh, offices were asked to operate at only 25%. 75% has to work from home. And then, uh, with the, as we as the cases subside, uh, we managed to then slowly increase the uh, level of economic activity. And this took place very well until we came to the uh, situation in June when the Delta variant and also subsequent to the national massive, uh, uh, what we call as the massive uh, homecoming, where during the Idul Fitri holiday, uh, millions and millions of people have the tendency to visit their hometowns. Now, of course, this is similar like Golden Week in Japan, probably. Uh, so uh, with this massive mobility, we, we, we impose uh, uh, restrictions. People were not allowed to travel. We restricted for two weeks the uh, travel, uh, the transportation modes like flights and buses and trains. But uh, uh, a number of uh, families still insisted on going back home and uh, try to get around the uh, borders. Uh, but, but then again, combined with the Delta variant, then uh, came the episode that I just explained earlier. Next. Now, how does this affect our business climate in East Java? If we can go to the next slide. Uh, operator, please, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so 85% uh, of businesses are affected uh, in, in, in the form of decreased uh, revenue. And we uh, divided it into large businesses, which we uh, initial BMB and small businesses SMB. So among the large businesses, only 53.7% operate normally. 28% has to reduce their capacity and 3.2% entirely stop their operation and about 14.9% uh, entirely operate from home. Uh, for smaller enterprises, uh, more than uh, nearly 60% are still operating normally. About uh, a quarter of them are operating with reduced capacity and about 10.5% have to cease operations. So a more a percentage of small enterprises are affected in terms of uh, having to stop operations. Uh, not many of them can work from home, only 5.1% or only one third of that of the large businesses because uh, a lot of these small businesses are really close contacts and uh, it is impossible for them to actually uh, shift their operations into virtual mode. Okay, now and there's a small number, 0.3 to 0.4% uh, that are over capacity, which are certain segment of businesses that actually flourish during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next. Okay, next slide. I'm so sorry. Could you? We still have uh, one more minute to go. If you could uh, proceed okay. uh, with the conclusion. Oh, all right, all right. Okay. So I was briefed that I had 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. All right. So okay. In the most importantly, as a closing note, if we can then let's conclude the slide. Okay. Most importantly, in the closing note, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to mention that it is a challenging time for all of us as a provincial government. Of course, we work together with mayors and region mayors who are at the forefront of really uh, uh, managing their uh, respective uh, 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 municipalities. And the challenge in the economy is really about the fact that reduced mobility leads to reduced economic volume. 60% of our economy comes from consumption. So the best uh, recipe for improving the economy is really stabilizing the COVID-19 outbreak. It's a prerequisite, we cannot compromise on that. So what we do during the most difficult time, we had to really uh, spend from our pocket, uh, from the government budget, a lot of social assistances. Nearly 6 million families were being helped in East Java alone with social assistances. Now social assistances can help them secure the most immediate needs such as food, uh, but it cannot help them with some of the challenges like uh, having a repayment of their loans and small businesses are still struggling. But this is the immediate to, in, to help the most vulnerable segment of the society. And, and then what we do is we make sure that the logistic uh, flow remains unencumbered. So uh, with all the restrictions, we had to close roads and we had to divert traffic. But we need to make sure that when it comes to people, when it comes to trucks and logistics that are 
distributing products and economic mobility, it needs to be still maintained well. Now, uh, uh, one third of our economy comes from manufacturing. And what we do is we have begun implementing uh, what we call as uh, the apps, uh, mobile apps, where people's health record are included there. So if they happen to be within the vicinity of somebody who has contracted COVID-19, it would show in the platform. And then when they check in using the QR code, then it will identify them as actually somebody who has been in close contact and they would be denied uh, entry into the premise. Now, these combination of technologies as well as social programs and ensuring that uh, it, uh, it's important economic activities remain in operation are at the, at the heart of our uh, current uh, COVID-19 pandemic handling strategy. I think with that, I'd like to conclude that. And of course, uh, the last thing is central government in Indonesia still has a large portion in terms of fiscal resources. At the same time, local government resources are really correlated with economic activities. We got a lot of our income from vehicle tax, and we know that sales of vehicle actually plummet. Uh, the local municipalities have their income from restaurant tax, from hotel tax, which also plummet, and also property transaction. So this is a difficult time where we have to contract our fiscal resources. We then have to increase spending in health, in social assistance, and therefore a lot of the major infrastructure spending has to be put on hold. So that's a challenge that we face right now. But if COVID-19 can actually keep declining, then we need to start looking into uh, additional ways to uh, improve and ensure that uh, critical spending can still be fulfilled, including uh, priority infrastructure investments. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, First Governor Emil for uh, sharing with us uh, the situation uh, in East Java and also uh, some solutions that uh, you have uh, also shared. And uh, so sorry that we have to cut you, but we will have uh, also session, uh, a discussion session. Maybe you can elaborate more uh, for uh, any question that uh, will come from the participants. Thank you. Let me uh, now invite uh, the third speaker. I, I'm not sure if Ms. Sheila Patel, ah, yeah, you are there. <laughs> I could see you. <laughs> so Sheila, thank you for uh, joining us. You are here representing the community and this COVID uh, is affected most communities, yeah? not only in Asia, but also in the world. So the questions uh, to you, and you also given uh, 10 minutes as, um, you know, as, um, important leader uh, among the community here. Um, how, how you see this um, um, new normal? Uh, what, what you think, because we have a lot of uh, local government leaders also here uh, with us. Uh, what you think that local government should prepare for uh, steady recovery uh, to sustainable prosperity? Thank you, Bernadia, and uh, thank you for all the organizers of this Congress for inviting me. I've been attending yesterday's sessions and listening to the leadership of uh, different countries who are speaking before me from Japan and Indonesia. We can all see the amazing contribution and value that leadership can contribute to addressing the challenges of not only COVID-19, but addressing serious poverty issues. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm Sheila Patel. I represent Shack Dwellers International, which is a global network of slum federations in 33 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And we work in about three to 400 cities in all those countries. And for us, the pandemic has been a serious wake-up call that has both confirmed what we believe needs to be done, uh, the power of partnerships between people living informally, their organizations and the city, and the deep long-term neglect of dealing with the urban poor, living informally as a class by themselves instead of being bunged into general poverty numbers. Because informality produces a huge range of additional burdens that somehow don't exist with those poor people who live in formal housing stock 
work in formal institutions. And so the issue here that I want to raise is that the pandemic really helped us to deal with three things. The first is that it really gave us the experience of a global event that did not leave anybody impacted, unimpacted. Uh, whether you lived in the global north, you lived in the global south, whether you lived in a formal environment or an informal environment, whether you were elite or you were poor, we were all subjected to this. But the differential impact on those who live in poverty was almost exponentially higher than that of those who were better off. So the first thing that came to our insight was that while the WHO said that you need to wear masks, you need to wash your hands, and you have to do social distancing, 33 to 40% of people who live in the cities in the global south did not have adequate water, could not do social distancing, and their governments and their municipalities did not actually have, in all, some of you did, but many didn't actually acknowledge the volumes of people who lived in these conditions. So both at the WHO level globally and at national and local levels, we tried to work out ways by which we could make people who are in leadership sensitive to this. The second very important thing was that within two weeks of all the kinds of lockdowns that people have mentioned, wages stopped in informal sectors. The people who bring you food, the people who work as vendors, the people who work in all informal subcontracting, wage earning, daily wage earning, their incomes dried up. Along with that, food dried up. Along with that, children who went to school found that they were stuck in small houses, six to eight people, who would be punished if you left your home. And most importantly, women, whether they worked or they stayed at home, had a 24 seven burden of caring for everybody. Even if there was no food, they had to find some way to get it. They didn't have voice, they didn't have representation. And the burden that women faced was unimaginable. We talk about the digitalization process. First of all, 75 to 90 percent of poor people who do have cell phones have old phones. They don't have the smartphones on which most of the digital software works. And therefore, communicating, interacting became doubly difficult because on the one hand, they couldn't recharge their phones. And on the other hand, they couldn't do this kind of communication that we are talking about. The other very important thing was that in any case, in all your cities, promotive primary and preventive health is already very poor in informal settlements. And therefore, the chronic diseases and the infectious disease that are comorbidities along with uh, COVID-19 have actually exponentially grown because most health systems were so busy dealing with COVID cases that things like dialysis, tuberculosis, medication provision, diabetes, all these things became neglected. It was nobody's fault per se, but it was the system that we had not anticipated such a crisis to happen. Just imagine three to four children sitting in the home with one old phone, or if they were lucky, a new phone, and being told that now all, all your education has to be home-based. The father's business is home-based. Everybody's fighting for one phone. Stella. And finally, okay. we find that in this crisis that we faced, that those cities which had engagement with communities whose municipal representatives were interactive with the neighborhoods benefited from that earlier relationship. 
there were however many more who did not have this relationship and therefore had to struggle harder to make a representation. Uh, the history and the evidence on television of migration, uh, our esteemed uh, leader from Java talked about uh, how people move. But in many cities, when migrants who came to work in cities found their wages gone, public transport closed, and inability to move, many of them had to walk home. We didn't have systemic solutions for those who could no longer live in the big city that we had. So the women's network with whom I functioned within Shack Dwellers International, we helped them all get smartphones and we began to interact to produce a cascade of information. And the women said that the, most, the three most critical things that they needed to do, first was to have a good diet uh, even when governments and municipalities provided food, their diet comprised mainly of carbohydrates. And we want to acknowledge the work of all the mayors who worked with communities to produce kitchen gardens so there would be greens in their meals. This was a big, big challenge. This impact we are going to face for a very long time. The second thing was transport. What do poor people do when there is no transport, both private and public, that can help them. And so it's a very big challenge for us during COVID and post COVID to look at the transport requirements of poor people who live informally so that even if their work begins, they don't have transport. And the third very, very important thing, which I think is both a pandemic present and post pandemic situation is that the climate change process that the IPCC now says is clearly indicative that it comes out of man-made impact on carbon emissions. In the last year, we have faced more rain, more heat, more wind, and more climatic impact that has destroyed people's homes, that has produced a realization that infrastructure in informal settlements is very weak, and we now have a campaign which is going to be announced in COP26 uh, by the champions of the uh, CAP program in the UK called A Roof Over Our Heads. It's basically poor women saying to their cities, to technology providers, to material production people that 93% of all housing stock of poor people is designed, built and financed by themselves. So uh, yeah. I'm finished. I'm yeah. finished. I'm just ending. And I invite everybody in your network, Panadia, to work with us in Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's really, really interesting. And you also uh, share with us the facts uh, how this COVID-19 uh, has uh, been impacted uh, this uh, informal sectors, particularly. And uh, we also noted uh, some of your suggestions, uh, you know, that you like to address to local leaders here, the importance of having a good infrastructure, particularly uh, public transportation. You also um, uh, underline the importance of uh, this good diet. And I think this COVID-19 also has been transforming people to move to uh, having more urban farming. I think this is a good sign uh, during this crisis, uh, we, we see also a big opportunities and we see much more green actually in many, many areas. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila, for uh, sharing with us uh, this uh, important aspects uh, in this COVID-19. Let me now invite the next speaker. We have here Ambassador Lee Jong Hyung from, from the International Affairs of Daejeon City. As uh, everyone knows, Daejeon will be hosting UCLG World Congress in 2022. So, Ambassador Lee, we are really looking forward to visiting your uh, city next year for the Congress. Yes, welcome. Uh, <laughs> ten, 10 minutes for you, Ambassador. Okay, Lee. thank you. Um, uh, mayors, uh, speakers, and participants, uh, good morning and good afternoon. Um, thank you, Secretary General, 
for inviting me to the plenary session. Uh, it is a great honor for me to uh, speak at the uh, ACE um, as a co Congress uh, on behalf of the mayor of Daejeon City. Uh, nearing the COVID-19, uh, I think it's an excellent idea to look into uh, how to uh, propel the new normal uh, in the ASPAC regions. I'm asked to focus on digitalization, and uh, I think it's a very sensible request because uh, uh, Daejeon is called uh, the city of uh, science in Korea, and uh, uh, it is well equipped with high quality um, digital infrastructure. So uh, Daejeon is providing uh, digitalized public services for all its citizens. Uh, under this backdrop, uh, I'm pleased to present about digitalization uh, in this session. Um, may I go to the next page? Well, uh, given the time limit, uh, I'd like to address um, under four titles uh, as shown in the slide. At first, I want to start with the uh, digital transformation. And then uh, let me look into uh, COVID-19 and uh, uh, ICT technologies. Uh, thirdly, uh, I want to share with you our policies and measures uh, pertaining to uh, digitalization. And uh, finally, and lastly, but not least, I want to draw your attention to the UCLG World Congress 2022 in Daejeon City, because uh, the Congress next year is going to take up uh, digitalization as uh, one of the key agenda. Uh, next page, please. Uh, some say digitalization, but others say digital transformation. Um, anyway, uh, we are very familiar with the concept of uh, first uh, industrial revolution, uh, which was upheld by Davos Forum in uh, 2016. Uh, in, in fact, uh, digital or digital transformation, uh, whatever we call, uh, had already been uh, on track uh, long ago before the COVID-19. Uh, personally, uh, I remember that I bought my first personal computer in uh, 1990 uh, when I graduated from university. Uh, since 2000, the ICT industries uh, have led uh, Korean economic growth, and uh, nowadays, uh, sales of uh, uh, semiconductors and uh, uh, smartphones uh, claim lion's share of Korean GDP. Um, now we stand on a new brink of uh, technological innovation called the uh, post industrial revolution. And um, uh, it is posted by new technologies uh, like uh, artificial intelligence, big data, internet of things, robotics, uh, etc. cetera. And uh, this revolution provides us not only with the opportunities, but also grueling challenges. Uh, we are given uh, uh, opportunities in the form of uh, new services, new businesses, and we have gained uh, huge productivity. Uh, however, uh, challenges are also very significant. Uh, social exclusion, uh, inequalities uh, have surfaced, and uh, we have faced with the problem of protecting uh, privacy issues. So uh, the real task facing us is to how to maximize the benefits and uh, how to minimize the uh, uh, risks. Okay, next slide, please. Um, during the COVID-19, uh, we were able to better uh, witness uh, opportunities and challenges. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, opened a new era of uh, uh, contact-free society, which was made possible by digital, digital technologies. So the COVID-19 uh, indeed accelerated the digital transformation at an alarming speed. Now, uh, uncontact services uh, have been sustaining our daily lives and businesses. More than anything else in Korea, uh, uh, K-quarantine, uh, or a new term that uh, describes Korean antivirus strategy, was possible thanks to uh, ICT technologies. So under the emergency situation, uh, people agreed to shift 
information sharing, even giving of privacy. Uh, on, on contact services and online meetings have become a uh, new normal. So the photo button left shows uh, our mayor, Ha Taejong, having weekly uh, STEM meetings uh, through the online. And uh, however, uh, many people began to express uh, concerns about the lack of uh, privacy protection. Uh, may I have a uh, next slide? Um, uh, let me refer you to the di digitalized and policies and measures uh, adopted and promoted by Daejeon City. We have uh, three uh, major policy directions for digitalization. Uh, first, Daejeon has digitalized the public administration and services. So Daejeon as a science city has tried to make the public services smarter with uh, digital technologies. So now we are able to make public uh, traffic services more efficient, and uh, we can use also digital technologies uh, to better identify people in emergency situation. And uh, now information services have become more accurate and swifter. Uh, secondly, we have also made effort to enhance digital in infrastructure. Unlike a conventional infrastructure, digital infrastructure has two distinctive aspects, physical infra and non-physical infra. Uh, the latter include uh, systems and uh, knowledge bases. So Daejeon has invested in areas such as uh, public Wi-Fi, uh, AI-based uh, CCTV management system, uh, safety-related uh, system integration, and the big data collection. Uh, at the Korean national level, as well as the local level, uh, we are strengthening uh, coding education for youth and children, uh, even at the elementary school level. Uh, thirdly, we have promoted uh, inclusive digitalization. As you know, uh, digital divide uh, emerged uh, even long ago. Then uh, uh, inclusiveness is becoming ever more relevant because uh, digitalization is a key driver in economic development and daily lives these days. So this is also the case because uh, most public services are provided through uh, digital equipment these days. Uh, therefore, uh, Daejeon City is uh, subsidizing phone bill for the poor, uh, teaching the old how to use uh, digital gadgets, and uh, developing information system for the handicapped. I think these uh, three policy directions are relevant, not only in the past, but also in the future. And uh, not only in the advanced cities, but also uh, developing uh, societies as well. So now at the margin of the COVID-19, uh, we are making final spurts to turn away, away from the COVID and uh, to return back to normal. Then uh, in this effort, we need, to be, we need to be connected one another uh, to find better solutions sharing insights, ideas, policies, and measures. So this imperative uh, leads me to my final page of presentation. Next page, please. Yeah, well, uh, currently, Daejeon is working hard to prepare the UCLD World Congress uh, 2022, which uh, is taking place provisionally from October 3rd to 7th in Daejeon City. And uh, Daejeon would like to make the Congress a meeting place to contemplate uh, how to return back to new normal after the pandemic. Uh, we'll table of issues such as SDG, climate change, cultures, anti-epidemic measures, and peace. Among these issues, uh, we, would, we would like to uh, highlight 
digitalization uh, in an effort to uh, promote digital economy and uh, uh, smart city at the local level. So please be our guest uh, next year in Daejeon and uh, let's discuss together how to enhance digitalization in a way to be beneficial to all the people. Uh, let me stop and thank you very much. Certainly we will be there next year with all the members of UCAG ASPAC because uh, this Congress is uh, organized here in Asia Pacific region in Daejeon City. So certainly we need to uh, make sure that the success of the Congress uh, with you Daejeon as a host uh, will be concretized or realized. Thank you. And also sharing with us uh, this uh, digitalization and transformation uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. And also you, it's good that you highlighted um, the importance of uh, having inclusive digitalization so that all groups uh, in the city uh, are also involved, including these uh, handicaps as well as uh, those uh, that have uh, limitations. So thank you, Ambassador uh, Lee. Now let me invite uh, the last speaker here, Ms. Li Wang from Zhengzhou Municipal Government. I hope the translation, Chinese translation is uh, working well. So Tom, time, uh, time is yours, Ms. Li. Sure, okay. Yeah. President of UCLG ASPA, Mr. Ashok, Secretary General Bernardia, and Madam Pan Xin Hong from the Foreign Affairs Office of the Municipality, Vice Governor Dadak, Suzuki Yasutomo, and uh, Director Hila Pata, Mr. Hun Jun Li, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Since 2020, human beings have been hit by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which has never been met before. Look into the human history. Human beings have uh, overcome all kinds of challenges with committed efforts and made great progresses in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. I believe the solidarity will help us to overcome the pandemic and usher in the brighter future. Today, I feel honored on behalf of the Zhengzhou Municipal Post Government to give a speech, and I had heard the previous speaker's speech. You have uh, all done your job. Now, as the last speaker for this morning's session, I'd like to share with you a very interesting topic. My topic is to have uh, the culture of Zhengzhou to echo in, in the progress of human beings. Zhengzhou is a city with profound history and uh, culture, and it is also an emerging city with a great vitality in its development. In recent years, Zhengzhou has implemented the strategy of uprising in Central Plain and the high quality development for the protection on the Yellow River Basin, and we focus on people's needs. We have seen remarkable achievements being made in promoting high quality development. Last year, hit by the pandemic, the GDP of Zhengzhou registered over 1.2 billion RMB. The general public expenditure revenue reached 125.9 billion RMB. The economic scale of uh, Zhengzhou ranked among the first among the central cities of China and ranks the number four at the northern cities of China. Culture is the asset of uh, people's wisdom and inheritance of culture, exchange and development are the pursuit for people to have a better life. Zhengzhou is the original place for culture. It enjoys sound and splendid culture and civilization. The non-lasting culture is the mimic picture of uh, the ancient Chinese civilization and Yellow River culture. Secretary General Xi Jinping pointed out that the 3,000 years of uh, Chinese 5,000 years history started from Central Plain of Zhengzhou. Zhengzhou is the key place for 
the development of Yellow River culture. Within its 300 kilometers diameter, it is one of the earliest habitat for Chinese civilization. And uh, we have the Tanghu relics, which is the oldest village, and uh, the oldest city, Xishan, ancient city, and the Wangchenggang, ancient capital, the earliest silk and ceramic products. We have the locust tree, Helu ancient capital relics, Arlito, Xia dynasty relics, Zhengzhou Guancheng, Shang dynasty, ancient capital relics. From the ancient time, different dynasties are competing, were competing for getting the city Zhengzhou. We now have uh, the famous books like He, Tu, Lu Shu, and the Book of Sun to share the knowledge from the ancient time. The Chinese civilization, Yellow River culture, has been developing in an innovative way. It is a place for the original development of Chinese civilization. You can explore the mysterious culture of uh, the civilization of China. If you know well on Zhengzhou, the city, you will know well on China's 3,000 years development. Zhengzhou is a place that integrate perfectly on both the culture and the nature. The Shaolin martial art was from the Shaolin Temple in Dengfeng, Zhengzhou City. And the Shaolin Kung Fu has become the cultural symbol and the national image as well as the best name card of uh, Zhengzhou. We have both the Chinese Kung Fu, we also have the Zen culture that um, stress on the harmonious coexistence of uh, human beings and uh, nature. Zen was from the Eastern philosophy, which stresses on the um, meditation of experience and inner heart. We also have uh, the Song Yue Pagoda. It's a smooth outside shape shows the perfect integration of culture and nature. The logo of uh, this Congress was inspired by the Songyue Pagoda. We also have the observation platform, which is one of the earliest architecture for the exploration on the size of uh, the local culture which records our attitude to exploring on the nature. We have bread, the Shaolin uh, temple and the Shaolin culture. Songshan Mountain is uh, one that uh, has a um, history of uh, 3.6 billion years, which is the first geological geographical park and the original place for Chinese civilization. We have sticked to the openness and the mutual sharing for promoting the human civilization. President Xi Jinping pointed out that culture shall be exchanged on a diversified view and we shall learn from each other for the further development. The broadcasting of the Mofi Shaolin Temple in 1982 ignited young people's aspiration for learning Shaolin martial art, which shown that Shaolin martial art has been well received by people from both China and overseas. The Shaolin Kung Fu has been exported to the overseas stages. Each year, we will have uh, over 2,000 performances of Shaolin Kung Fu with uh, Five million audience come for the Shaolin Kung Fu. Take Tago Martial Arts School as an example. From 2003 to now, the performance from this school has been shown for the 17th time in the CCTV Spring Gala performance and won the prize for five times. And the martial art performance from this school has been 
seen in the ASEAN Olympics, Shanghai Paralympics, and Beijing Olympics, and the Paralympics, as well as the uh, G20 Cultural Evening Gala. During the past three decades, we have uh, sent out over 2,300 performers in 236 times to overseas for promoting the tourism and cultural exchange activities. They have run through Asia, Europe, US, uh, Australia, Africa, and other regions. We have uh, dig into the cultural incarnation centered on the Shaolin Kung Fu and uh, developed this business mode. In 2005, we have uh, built up and launched out the Zen musical ceremony. And we have received over 4.6 million people visits by 3,000 performances. And the Ministry of Culture of China has uh, named this place as the National Cultural Industrial Demonstration Base. The innovation gave us the opportunity for making progress. The progress of uh, human beings in our society also shown our effort in responding to natural disasters and wars. From 2020, at, from its beginning to now, Zhengzhou has been suffering for the past two years, making us experience great challenges. The challenge of uh, the flooding in July and the pandemic in August this year informed us to faster our pace to explore the new development mode for the economic and social progress and the protection of the ecological environment. We'll take cultural as a base to drive the economic development. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have 250,000 vo volunteers serve the society. They have become the name card for the city. We have launched out innovation for the civilized development and launched out the regulations to the sanitation, waste disposing, as well as imposed on the regular anti-pandemic approaches to our social society and guide our citizens to form the habit of a healthy living. We have encouraged people to learn more on the pandemic. We have choreographed the song we can has been well received by the public. And the performance doctors have uh, been performed on the Henan Spring Gala, which have been well recognized by people from China. The East Railway Station of Zhengzhou Shaolin Kung Fu videos have been come overnight heat. Especially the performance gala on the evening of Tang Dynasty has become a hard discussed topic and overnight topic through the performance on the Zhengzhou Spring Gala and the Henan Spring Gala. And we have also choreographed the dance show like no one shall be left behind. We have utilized the culture to invigorate our commit our strong face to build up a moderately proper society. After the first round of pandemic we have taken swift measures to pr promote the stabilization of employment and uh, boost confidence by driving up the cultural and tourism consumption. Currently, the tourism has basically come back to the level before the pandemic. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, as one member of UCLG ASPA, Zhengzhou is always ready to take culture as a bond to actively promote and intensify our cultural exchange and cooperation with all member cities. We will 
tell a good story about cooperation between Zhengzhou and uh, UCLG ASPA, as well as our cooperation for the common development, so as to promote this economic recovery of the UCLG ASPA to the sustainable prosperity after the pandemic. I hope after the pandemic you can have the, you can take time to have the field trip in Zhengzhou and enjoy the local food and beautiful scenery. So we welcome you to have a deep cooperation. Thank you very much for the future. Right Miss Lee, I, I can agree more with you how important culture is in our life and also uh, congratulations uh, because of uh, good work that Zhengzhou has, you managed to also bring back this tourism industry. We know that tourism industry has been affected most uh, because of COVID, but you managed to um, recover from, from that. And um, of course, we really love to visit your city as pity because of this uh, situation. Uh, we could not uh, visit your place, but I'm sure in the future we will find a chance for that. So because of the time limitation, uh, we will not have much time for discussions, but um, let me spend uh, five or seven minutes to ask the speakers uh, because we have actually collected uh, questions uh, from members and audiences. Uh, my first question, uh, I'll ask uh, Mayor Suzuki. You, you have, uh, you know, experienced this COVID-19. And could you elaborate more? What is your outlook uh, on society uh, in this new normal? Perhaps COVID will still be there. Uh, next year and then next year, but uh, what, what do you see uh, as the outlook of your society? Mr. Suzuki? All right. In Japan, uh, strict regulations such as those for online health examination have started to relax due to the COVID-19 crisis. It has also exposed the side cannot vulnerabilities the of big cities and made new opportunities for regional areas Zhengzhou with good side cannot living hear the speaker. The interpreter em based in Zhengzhou cannot hear. The potential of digitalization, such as the options to work remotely, we aim to build a multi-nuclear Thank you. We, we, we heard only in the first part, but we couldn't hear in the last part, maybe because of this connection uh, from uh, us or from your side. But uh, you, you mentioned that um, the people uh, feel more relaxed, and now, of course, we have this uh, custom of uh, working from home and, and have more time with the family. I think this is a good insight, good also a positive side of uh, these uh, situations. Thank you, Mayor Suzuki. I'd like to ask uh, another uh, four speakers. Uh, the question is the same for all of you. Could you maybe um, tell us what could be a good strategy um, for uh, speeding up this recovery uh, process uh, or uh, having a new normal living with uh, this COVID-19? Could I ask uh, maybe Vice Governor uh, Amy Dadak one minute? You could also include this as a statement from your side, please. Yeah, in the second quarter of 2021, uh, our economy grew by 7.05% and uh, compared with 2020. So that's a good sign that the economy is recovering. So how did we achieve that? Uh, very importantly, as I said earlier, that uh, the current way we measure Antia. Nadia, I, think you, I think you are muted, Vice Governor. We couldn't hear you. Can somebody fix this uh, connection? Connection. I'm probably. I now it's okay. Now. Yes, we can hear you now. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'll repeat again. We grew by 7.07% uh, in uh, the second quarter of 2021. 
of course in the third quarter we expect the number to be much less because of the uh, massive uh, case uh, increase in July and August but uh, what, what I'd like to say is uh, the key is really about controlling keeping the COVID at check. Uh, the people have been adapting massively with the use of online ordering. Uh, and uh, there are two types of businesses, one that actually temporarily suffer and one that actually have begun losing their competitive edge. Now, uh, the government need to identify these uh, sunset businesses sectors and, and start to uh, uh, really uh, refocus them on things that actually have better prospect going forward. Now, this requires a combination of uh, labor uh, capacity building as well as uh, also economic development programs. Uh, for example, we have the Millennial Job Center, which focuses on helping uh, now nearly 2,000 small medium enterprises to transform their businesses by uh, mobilizing uh, young talents in the field of photography, uh, product photography, digital marketing, uh, programming, and so on. And, and, and what is also the beauty of this program is we also empower these 2,000 talents uh, uh, in the world of freelancing. The future is no longer about employment, working nine to five full time. It's about freelance, looking for clients, not looking for employers. So we, we're, hit, uh, we're uh, hitting two birds with one stone. We're helping small, medium enterprises transform uh, to the digital landscape, build their competitive edge, because now they have to compete with businesses all around Indonesia and at the same time, we're empowering the talents to actually start uh, building a career as a freelance. So that's one of the examples that we can provide at this uh, forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Governor. This is great uh, also to hear this uh, big campaign you have on the Millennium Campaign and also engaging these uh, young people and making sure that they are also part of this development and, of course, part of the solutions. Uh, and um, also you mentioned... Um, the important that um, this is an opportunity for us and we need to be able to adapt quickly uh, in this uh, uh, situation. Thank you, thank you, Vice Governor. Let me now invite Ambassador Lee. You have also a uh, floor, one minute. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, the COVID is still on the way, so uh, that's why you have to uh, vaccinate the people first, then uh, when we reach the high level of vaccination, then uh, uh, we, we can more active uh, policies to recover economy and uh, our uh, daily lives. So particularly uh, both uh, for the uh, central government as well as local government, uh, at the policy level, they should take care of uh, people who are heavily affected during the COVID. Uh, particularly include uh, um, small and uh, uh, mini, uh, mini minimized businesses. So that's the step uh, we have to going forward. Then uh, uh, for the next year in Daejeon, so we would like to uh, um, discuss and address those issues uh, uh, having an, uh, going forward uh, to, to recovery from the uh, current pandemic. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador Lee. Maybe I'll, I'll move for uh, Ms. Lee Pang, and then last I'll ask Sela to kind of wrap up, uh, you know, you may want to have a statement. So, thank you. Can I invite Ms. Lee Pang? One minute. On July 22nd, uh, Chenzhou was hit by a strong storm, and then we were affected by the second round of the uh, novel coronavirus. We withstood the test very well, and our government is always with our people. We stand together. And uh, early September, all endeavors of our work have restored very normally. Uh, talking about culture and uh, tourism, we hope in this year, this month, we hope our tourist spots can be repaired and uh, brought to normal conditions, and we're going to receive very strong support from our government. Uh, before October 1st holiday, we hope that we can do these repairs very well. Hope that our tourism will start very well since October 1st holiday. National Day holiday. We also hope that within three or four months, our society will store and recover very well in all fronts. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Sissie. Last, Shela Patel from India. Miss Shela, you have a kind of uh, also one so minute. Much. Yes. This Just has one been minute. very instructive. <laughs> yes, yes. So the first thing I want to say is I really want to acknowledge the investments people have to make in youth mm -hmm. and in the future of jobs. And there are three criteria for this. One, that you make sure that poor and vulnerable youth get the same opportunities that those who are informal. The second thing is cities better get ready for a huge input of migration mm -hmm. because you will find that climate will impact that. And the third thing is for the first time, you will find that climate change and SDGs are two sides of the same coin and we have all been doing very badly on both. So all over the world in the discussions on climate change, cities think that people are talking about us, but they are not. And you and us have to work to raise this to say that cities are the final markets for everything. And only when we transform our businesses and our capacity building into green processes will the world have a chance. So I want to bring these three things to you. I want to be part of your discussions and your future plans. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Sela. I think this very, very strong message. And I'm sure uh, mayors and local leaders uh, here also um, listen to what you said, the importance of uh, making good investment uh, in youth as well. And of course, we cannot forget this um, uh, youth in, uh, fellow in uh, vulnerable youth and of course, uh, informal uh, sectors as well. And the importance of uh, making right decision now actually uh, for uh, better cities, uh, better future, because um, like as you said, climate change is, is already in front of uh, our eyes and also what we have been uh, experiencing right now. And of course, the importance of localization SDGs. Thank you once again, uh, all the speakers. I will not be uh, going to wrap up because I will be also speaking later in the closing in which uh, this wrap up I will uh, uh, say uh, during the closing. So once again, uh, I like to uh, give a big, big thanks and appreciations to all excellent speakers. I think you should join me for a big applause to all speakers today. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the insights. Uh, immediately after this, we will have an uh, executive bureau meeting. So I like to have uh, members of the executive bureau to stay, but uh, let me uh, give this mic back to the MC so that uh, she can e explain what will be in the next program. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. And thank you very much, Dr. Bonadia, for uh, hosting and moderating such a wonderful plenary session. Thank you to all the guests for giving your inputs. It has definitely been a learning session uh, so far. Um, allow me to inform you that the UCLG ASPAC uh, members, after this, will have the statutory meetings, the Executive Bureau meeting, and the Council meeting. And the next agenda, we will have a closing ceremony and we will open for public who have already registered as well. Until then, uh, I guess we'll be joining in from a different link. Thank you so much and we'll see you soon. Recording COVID-19 has a devastating Recording impact in, in all countries around the world. Recording the pandemic stopped. is no longer solely a health crisis. It has greatly affected the critical social economy and livelihood of the people. COVID-19 also brought us opportunities in enhancing a new form of cooperation. Local governments have taken the lead role in surviving and recovering from the pandemic with strong initiatives to support the community. The spirit of getting back stronger goes across the borders. It needs united efforts of local governments with key actors such as civil society and corporations. As an association, UCLG ASPAC plays a vital role in bridging the strength of its wide network.
WCLG ASPAC has been providing platforms for its members and beyond to learn about the latest updates, local actions, and knowledge on pandemic recovery. We share the lessons learned and experiences on how to transform our cities, our regions to be aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals. Long-term solutions are not possible unless COVID-19 recovery and the SDGs go hand in hand. Apart from the socio-economic crisis, it is necessary to prioritize a cleaner, greener, and healthier environment during this extraordinary time. Cities in the Asia-Pacific region are simultaneously facing climate change issues. Therefore, working towards green recovery is crucial as they must be prepared and resilient in an unprecedented climate change scenario. The new normal era has forced us to adopt cooperation at the next level. UCLG ASPAC has been using technology to conduct virtual events such as online discussion forums and technical assistance, e-trainings, surveys in cooperation with various partners. These are aimed to enhance the capacity of local governments in SDGs localization, climate resilience, education, local economic development, disaster risk reduction, and cultural integration to city development. UCLG ASPAC has also outreach materials, publications, and guidelines on COVID-19 response for local governments, pocketbooks, research, policy recommendations, and best practices, all accessible anytime through our website. Are you ready to embrace the new normal? UCLG ASPAC calls all members, cities, and local governments, and you, to join hands in collaboration and embrace the new and effective approaches and implementing strategies in driving a sustained recovery. Make the right direction. Make the right decision. And how we want to proceed, I think we can solve this problem. Let's start now, not tomorrow. Let's start together, not alone. Let's start now together.